We have Dustin Service with me here today. Dustin, I really appreciate your time. I'm going to direct everybody to your website. So head over to servicewealth.com. But there's a trick here. You got to spell service, S-E-R-V-I-S-S. And to make things easier, I'm going to make sure to have that link as a clickable one in the show notes. So Dustin, we're going to talk about wealth management, but more importantly, some mindset, I think, here today, because I think that's a big aspect to all of this. But really appreciate your time. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, you're bang on mindset and in real estate, whether it's wealth creation in real estate or in investments, it starts with the foundation of good thinking and mind nourishment. So let's get into it. Sure. First of all, let's talk a little bit about how you found your way into this, because I know you have an interesting hobby and some other interests outside of financial planning and real estate investing. So based on some of the background I saw, it's been interesting just to position as to how you might have found your way here. I, I don't know if which items you're referring to, but the marksmanship, the the snowmobiling, it's yeah, I'm up in Canada in the West. You can't see my yard, but there's uh, six inches of snow and snowmobiling once or twice a week is a big thing. So uh, I would say from those early days of being interested in problem solving. So you have an activity you've got a problem or you want to get better at it. So that is a, that's the problem. Usually when you're doing an activity, you're trying it, you're being taught how to do something. And then it's always the learning. And that's what fuels you to keep trying it and keep getting better. And that's always been something in my genes of just always trying, experimenting. What could I do to get better? And just really being consistent with uh, good practice. And so that was, I took civil engineering in school actually, but was trading stock at office during the day. And that led to moving careers after a few years of that and being in the wealth management business for about 17 years now. And that still is something that I'm doing today. I'm experimenting with my own money before putting client money into anything or with real estate. I'm part of different mastermind groups and just really that's, I feel like that's my tribe. I feel like I found a community who likes be dealing with money and, and getting to, uh, using certain vehicles. I, I was going to point out the fact that you, you brought it up with your civil engineering, but you probably have more acronyms behind your name than anybody I've ever had on the show. Yeah, I, I don't know where that's from. I think somewhere along the lines, I don't know if I, I didn't make the rep team playing soccer. I made the B rep <laughs> team. So I didn't make the A team. I made the B team. And that was from a very young age. So I don't know if there's a, been a bit of a chip on my shoulder from that for a long time. So what my theory was, I wanted to work with successful entrepreneurs right from the start of my career. And so I thought, you know what, if I get the most credentials, that will separate myself. And the second part of that was it'll be my safety net. I started out independent, building my own business right away. I probably wouldn't recommend that to someone getting in the financial planning space. I would go to a bank or somewhere for a few years, get your base and then move out on your own. But the credentials were my safety net. I thought, you know what, I could blow this whole career up, be in debt, have no money and no clients. But if I got these credentials, I could always probably make 150000 a year working for some company. And so that became for a decade an addiction. And so one credential to the next. And I stopped learning and taking courses. Those courses are they're time consuming and I have small kids now and stuff. It's just not as easy to do. But the amount of learning I, I, I had in those led me to add value to two partners who were good at bringing in files, but didn't have the credentials that I had. So they were good at bringing in high net worth clients. I would build the plans. And so it was twofold. It was good for them because it allowed them to leverage the business. And it was good for me because in my early years of my career, I got exposed to way, a lot more files and a lot more complex files than I probably should have at that tenure of my business. When I did leave that partnership after eight years, it was it just parlayed nice into building my own practice. Well, it's interesting that you focus so heavily on your career and your trajectory there and getting those credentials where most people struggle to plan for a $500 emergency in the United States. I think that was the average that most people don't have enough in their savings to even handle a $500 emergency. How would you suggest somebody break through or reset their mindset in order to ensure that they're taken care of, at least to that level? The most basic, even when I'm talking to somebody who, who's got healthy financial means, it's right down to anybody looking to get a plan. 
We use an acronym called BAM. So B-A-M. That's your bare ass minimum. These are the expenses <laughs> that exist uh, just for you to live. So your food, your rent or your mortgage payment, not the, the fancy purses or the traveling or all that stuff would go away that the fancy purses and the traveling if you were just stripped right down to your bare ass minimum. And most people won't take the time or don't want to because maybe out of fear of actually looking at the last three months of their expenses in their bank account. If any, anyone has online banking, one exercise my wife and I do that's a little bit nerdy, but it's got a purpose, is we will print our last three months visa statements once a year, every September. I don't know why it's that, but that's the time we do it. We lay it out and we show each other and we talk about it. And it isn't to point fingers at what you spend or I spend. It literally is to get optics on where is the money going and is it in line with our goals or values? If my goal, if said listener, if you say, I want to buy my second rental place or my first rental place, is your spending helping you get closer to that? And until you get optics and until you look at that and just, it doesn't take long. We don't do other than printing the three months of statements. We literally just go down, highlight a couple recurring things. Again, it's winter snowmobiling is my thing. So gas sled parts, traveling for, to, for trips. That's where my money would be showing multiple. That, that's a goal for me. That is a reset being an entrepreneur and busy. That time away, that's actually where I relax. Being out in the forest, the sound of what the engine, that, that's how, where I relax. And if I don't do that, I'm a grouch and that isn't good for my family. That conversation with those expenses becomes very robust from a communication standpoint with your spouse or your partner. Because it's a, again, when, when we sit down, we both say to each other, this is a safe environment. No one's allowed to get mad about anything because it really is just open communication. Well, that's great to talk about. Say, hey, listen, I want, instead of when you're in a fight trying to position something, you're able to bring it out before it say, I want this to be an important part of my life. And it goes for the other, because your other, your partner can say some things and you can say, yeah, that's okay. Now I know. And so we're, I know we're talking real estate in the podcast, but it's, really mindset of spending. So to, you know, your original question for if we don't have 500 of savings, likely there is 500 of savings in a couple months for many people if you just break it down. And again, on our website, if you go up to the contact us page, servicewealth.com, say, please send me the BAM tracker. I'm happy to share that tracker with you. I really appreciate that offer. And I'll, I'll make sure again to have that link in the show notes so they are easy to find you. So you mentioned that that spending mindset, that seems to be a something that has been ingrained in us from a young age is credit, spend, and we're always living paycheck to paycheck. Is there, outside of being honest with yourself and your spouse and you're going through that activity that you just suggested, is there any other day-to-day -day strategies that somebody should consider taking on in order to get out of that spur of the moment spending mindset like we have. Yeah, I think it just, you've really got to spend, and it isn't a lot of time, but you need to create an environment, whether it's, you say on Sunday, you put it in your calendar, block it. I did a lot of blocking in my calendar and say on three Sundays from now, I'm blocking out from eight till 10. And I want to really figure out this question. And it, it comes from a guy named Dan Sullivan. It's called the R factor question. And the question is in the next 12 months, for me to feel happy with my progress personally and professionally, I want to see this happen. And so between now and the next 12 months, if you put yourself 12 months out and you say, oh, I'm so happy we did this great year, this is what happened. And so if you write that down and try and really you know, manifest around that, what that looks like, it will help you make that decision when you're about to spend on something. It will just be that an online is just as bad now where it's so easy. Your visa is already in your Amazon account pre-populated. I had it the other day where I put something in my cart and I was, who left it. And then I went out and when I came back, I went to Amazon to look up something else. And my cart was already up with that thing ready to go. And it was just like, oh, confirm. Yeah, no. And I just hit the next action I took was confirm and it the order was in. Mm -hmm. And so you know, then I went and looked for whatever else I was looking for. So it's, it's, we're, we're getting to that point where society, you're picking up your phone to scroll when you've got four minutes in the lineup at the grocery store. Those kind of moments are when you need something more powerful to help your willpower to say, I'm doing this. And again, there's tons of books on this topic or vision boards and 
create, you know, change your wallpaper on your computer. So when you log in, it's what you've set your intention to have. That does help because it just gives your mind that reinforcement. No, I'm, I've got a bigger thing. Rental real estate. Maybe you're trying to buy an apartment building. Maybe you're trying to buy again, a duplex, whatever the unit is, maybe having a picture of that because some of those things you want to buy in real estate, it might be bigger than actually you can pull off even with no savings or some savings. You need the universe to work for you. I'm not a super religious person, but you need that universe to work for you and align you with maybe there's a partner. Maybe there's a little old grandma that you that lives down the road from you that has that property that you're mowing your lawn or she's mowing your lawn. And you decide, I'm going to pull over and talk to her. And those kind of things do play in, play back to spending and how you manage your finance. You also mentioned those conversations with your spouse. And that can probably be some of the most that's probably has ended more marriages than any other is the, is that discussion around money or the stress associated with money. Are there any strategies or tactics there that you've come across that might make that those conversations and that? Yeah. Along the open communication, a long time ago, my wife, Jody and I sat down and we said, okay, what are our retirement visions. And so how, how do we envision retiring? And she said, we, we're going to keep uh, flipping houses. And I said, okay, we should use a stock market. And I'm a real estate supporter. I like real estate. So that was an aha moment to say, okay, how could we do both? Like it doesn't have to be either or. For this period of time, we as a couple felt comfortable with flipping houses. And it wasn't like we were flipping multiple every you know year. It was just, we simply built a house because that was easy for us to get our heads around. We built a house lived in it for a while, sold it. We've recently built another house. And so that's our common goal that we can easily get behind together because we know it makes sense. We can easily quantify the numbers. The stock market, again, I've you know used it for 17 years with clients. I've seen it you know do great things for people. I've also seen it be uh, a stress point where people need to get out. <laughs> that's not to say real estate is a stress-free thing, but it is something where, you know, and again, I'm talking about building houses that you live in, but when you build a house, our philosophy has been quite simple. It's like when you build a house, there is a layer of downside protection. Even if you have a hire a builder to build it, if you negotiate what they get paid reasonable, when you take a raw piece of land, if you've built it in a, a raw piece of lot, and you've created new value to that area, to that spot. And so say it costs 700000 to buy a lot and build a house. If you do the landscaping, you decorate the house, makes it, maybe you got a renter in, in a suite in the basement. That house is probably worth seven fifty dollars right away as soon as it's done. So you've got this protection that if the market went down 5%, the moment you bought it and you needed to sell a double storm, you're probably going to be okay or reasonably close. Whereas if you buy a house for seven fifty, dollars and the market goes down 5% right away, you better hope you negotiated or your realtor negotiated that piece of property well, because you, you, haven't, you haven't really built the value. It's probably already there. So again, that's just my own opinion. Everyone can do it different, but that's what's worked for us. When I visited your website, it's mentioned a couple of times, uh, the new wealth mindset. Do you mind spending a little time discussing a little bit what that means? So new wealth mindset, meaning when, and this is just, again, my interpretation, we've got certain experiences and beliefs that we get locked onto our brain like barnacles, whether we recognize them or not. And we pick those up from our parents. We pick those up from our people that are in our lives when we're younger. We pick them up in the books we read when we're younger and we create these things. And so again, I'm 41 years old, say 22 years of significant work experience. In, in that time, I produced this belief that you work extremely hard my dad was a hard worker, traveled 180 days a year. So I'm assuming that's where I picked that up. And somewhere I picked it up that you need to basically just save as much as you can, work as hard as you can. And then when you retire, hopefully you've got above average savings and investments and you will be above average happier than other said person. And so that was a successful life. But no one really identifies how hard you need to work for how long. And if you do work so hard and reinvest everything into your business and you don't really experience life, you probably will retire single and mentally ill. And I've seen that through existing clients. And then I've seen it where existing clients have done what I would say something more intentional, which is 
what if we could build a bit of a plan? It doesn't have to be this long paged report, but just a, a visual in one page and say, okay, if we do these things, then we could spend more money now. And, and so that means save less. That might mean working a little less and saving the same. So again, if you've got a certain kind of thing, I'll explain it this way. Imagine there is a, a box in your basement and it's a machine and it spits out money. Every month, that machine out the conveyor belt comes, I'll say $10,000. This is your income. So $10,000 comes out. You've got your BAM, which is your money you need to live on. So let's say 5,000 gets kicked off the conveyor belt into the BAM bucket. Now we've only got 5,000 moving down the conveyor belt. You then say, okay, we need an, uh, an emergency savings. So we're going to put 500 a month into that. So it kicks off 500. Now you only have 4,500 coming down. You see where I'm going with this. Then mm -hmm. the next bucket might be a core investment. So this might be just a middle of the road, you fill in the blank investment. Real estate. Okay. Maybe we've got a, a property that negative cash flows a little bit, but we've got a bigger vision for it. We're going to up the rent. We're going to develop the other side. We're going to put a suite in the basement. So we've got negative cash flow. Okay. Bam. We, we, and then we got a high risk bucket. Maybe this is your crypto, your penny stocks, whatever you want. That's enough that when you build up an account, if it bumps and goes up two times, you feel it, but not enough that it affects, if it goes to zero, which it has the high likelihood that it will, that you haven't affected your family. And if you do this and there's more money still coming off the conveyor belt, then that money you purposely spend. So the idea is that you're living more of your life now, yet being responsible for your future. Because if you map it out, which we do with our clients, is map out the next 15, 20 years. If you checked off all those boxes of those responsible buckets that it was kicking money off into, here's what the number would be. And so if that number is above what you think is needed, then you could actually save less. And so now all of a sudden you've got to you'll not save 2000 into the real estate bucket. Let's say 1500. Well, now you got 500 extra to spend. The one thing I didn't mention in there, which is very important, is risk management. One of those buckets on the conveyor belt is what happens if I die? What happens if I get hurt or sick and can't work? And if someone hasn't significantly researched that or addressed it, if you're single and you don't have a mortgage, I wouldn't worry too much about putting in bucket there. If you are the breadwinner for your family and you have a decent income, if that income is gone, what, hap what happens to your BAM? And that's why it's so important to know what your BAM is. Your bare ass minimum. If you can't work and generate an income, who's paying the expenses? Well, if you got tons of real estate and stocks and you can figure out, oh, I, my BAM will be covered for 25 months. Okay. Well, then that, that might be, that might be acceptable, but Maybe you don't want to sell your real estate. Maybe you don't want to sell your stocks when they're down because it's a COVID crash and it's down 35%. So disability insurance maybe comes from your work, maybe comes from a broker. We've touched briefly on real estate investing. Can you talk a little bit about how you've incorporated? It sounds like you're doing more of a balancing act between real estate investing and the traditional financial planner. It's, it seems to be a little bit more imaginative than some of the financial planners that I've had experience with in the past. I just don't think the market is the end all be all for the whole plan. For some people, my older clients that say, I just don't want tenants. The idea of buying said stock or whatever stock, and I could get a 4% dividend and it's a business that's been around for a hundred years. That's appealing because they just, it's hands off. Yeah, it could go to zero, but so could your real estate. But when I look at our like, like our old picture, real estate has been a byproduct of certain things. So I had an office, I was paying rent. So I thought, well, why wouldn't I just pay myself? So I bought a building with a partner because I couldn't afford the whole thing. So bought a partner. We built an office space and we needed two off, one office each. And we put five other offices in it and rented those out for 750 or, or a thousand a month. And then there was workspaces, you know, for 500. So my net you know, at one point I was paying uh, 2,500 a month in rent. My rent then became a thousand a month was really my net cost once I owned the building. Yeah, I had to sign up for the big loan and all that thing. Well, that was, uh, you know, my office space. Uh, a warehouse was a byproduct of a client saying, I've never bought commercial real estate. And uh, what do you think? And, and this is he's a close friend. I said, why don't we do the research together as an exercise? And so one of the people in the office that was renting was a commercial realtor. We told him roughly what the budget was. 
he found it. We went and looked at it. We vetted it. I took some of the responsibilities. He took some of the responsibilities and we bought this warehouse together, which has been, it's been okay. And so then the final piece that that's left, I, I have had some rental houses in there, but currently we have an acreage that we live on that we're going to develop at some point. Who knows when that'll be, but it's, we almost think of it as like an RSP or a 401k. It's just, we live here. We built a house here. We know that we could develop it at some point, but we like the property the way it sits now. So it just is something that we're just sit and hold. So again, it hasn't been, we built and flipped a house six months ago and that was more, the market was there. I don't know if the market would still be there to pull that off and make uh, a meaningful enough profit. But currently my still vision is trying to find rental houses in our region. It's tough. Cap rates are 3%. So you're really, you've got to find something with some value add that you can do. So I don't mm-hmm. know where your listener predominantly is, but if they're, I still think rental real estate is such a simple thing. If someone's paying down your mortgage, it's just time. As a younger person, people don't want time anymore. They want, mm-hmm. I don't know, listener, what you're thinking, but it's like, my father and I have these great, my father-in-law and I have great debates and he's a home builder. And he, he says, why wouldn't you just want to flip the house and get the money now instead of waiting for so long? And, and I, I, I get it, but it isn't always that you can do that. It's, it's a long game. Yeah. If I had to go back in time when I came like that first time home buyer, I live in the United States. So the first time home buyer program lets you acquire up to a fourplex actually. Oh. here in the U.S. So if I had known that at the time, that would have been the first property I would have bought. I would have bought a fourplex, lived in one unit, and rented out the other three. Yeah, smart. This is a particularly interesting regarding the whole financial planning, and you mentioned the economic conditions briefly in 708. Do you see anything regarding our current economy and what people should be bracing for? It's, I get often asked this on shows. I would say I'm not an economist, so I, w- I would leave that to the professionals to, to answer that. I, I will say from my observation, no matter what market it's been through, and again, I've been through lots of hard times with clients, is controlling the things you can control. And again, that cut, the BAM is one piece of a bigger picture. We use something called a Life Clarity Summit, and it really is a pyramid. And on, in that pyramid, again, without a diagram, you'll still get it. At the bottom, the widest part is your financial plan. The fact that you're listening to this podcast could be your financial plan. You're getting your mind in a state of, I want to do something. So you've got your financial plan at the bottom. The next layer up, a little bit more narrow, is what happens from a risk risk management standpoint. This is if you die, if you get sick, hurt. And in there, though, is something that not a lot of financial advisors talk about, which is leisure spending, health, and relationships, like social connections. One of the things that I observe with some older clients is this infatuation with that hard work, their business, they pour all that time, they lose their hobbies because they have kids or whatever, and they've just got business. They try to keep their family together. Then they sell their business. Then the kids move out of the house. And now they're trying to reform those hobbies and those friendships, which is very difficult when you get older without, without getting out of your comfort zone. And lots of people don't want to get out of the comfort zone at that age. Even I'm a 41 to go to a new gym, to go to a new group. It takes work and you don't have those friendships. Like when you're in university, spending so much time with people or at the job you spend when you got all the time in the world, making sure that you spend some money on the things that you enjoy and spend the time with the people because no one wants to be rich and lonely once you get to retirement. Up the next layer is your wealth accumulation. So we've got the bottom financial plan, next layer up to risk management. So now the goals that you want to do, you've managed for the risk so that if something happens, it doesn't affect your goals. Now you're ready to accumulate. In the accumulation zone, why it's above risk management is because opportunities usually need to be acted on fairly quickly. If you don't have your risks managed, it's one more thing to think about. So if you're going to make that offer on that duplex, sixplex, 32 unit apartment building, if you've got a nagging like, oh, like if this doesn't go right, what'll happen? If you've already dealt with that, you can act quickly and you can act in offense instead of being in a kind of neutral defense position. So in the accumulation zone, this is where you're building up your investments. This is where you're paying off debt, building up real estate. 
and also paying attention to your mental health. Because usually in this accumulation zone, it happens, doesn't usually happen right away in your 20s. It might for some people, but for the bulk of people, it's in your late 30s. You have some kids going, you've got your debt, you've got your incomes going up. You've got to pay attention to your mental health. What are you putting into your mind? Mind nourishment can come in many forms, either stay curious and take courses or podcasts or books. And remember, you are the sum of the five closest influences around you. That can be your spouse, your ex-spouse, your parents, coworker, your boss. Be aware that those influences can affect your trajectory. So if those influences you recognize aren't the same trajectory you are looking to be on, you need to make a change. And the final piece of the Life Clarity Summit is selling your business or transitioning your career and estate planning. And estate planning, yeah, it's a boring topic. Do the lawyer documents, all that stuff. But really, I love to talk about estate planning from passing your knowledge on to your children. What are you telling your children? What are you sharing with your children about money, finance, and wealth mindset? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one of those things that I've always found interesting because the way, and I've already seen that because there's certain things that I will do in response to the cost of different things or what have you. And I'm afraid that what the way I respond is something that I'm going to be passing on to my kids. What I when mean, you look at a menu, Jack, do you look at the, the price first and then work to the left to the food item? Yeah, I do. Yeah, many people do. And instead of just enjoying the, the moment and then, and then I've caught my, my son especially doing the same thing now going, does dad want to pay for that? Yeah. So that, that actually has started to really bother me. Yeah, I've got, you can see the video. I've got a diastema on my teeth and I, it's just kind of part of my look. But when I, I remember significantly being 12 or 11 and talking about braces with the dentist. And I remember thinking, no, like I don't want my parents to have to pay for this. And so somewhere before that age, that got ingrained in me. And so then when they said, what do we want to do, you want to do this? I, I really played up that I didn't actually want it. So that now it's part of my character and, but I do remember that even at 12. Yeah. I think you're on the right track, uh, paying attention to what, what, what traits you're teaching your son. Yeah. This has been a really great conversation, Dustin, uh, but before I let you go, I want to remind everybody to head over to your website. It is servicewealth.com and check out his podcast as, as well. So you're going to have to do a search, go for the picture of wealth podcast. I saw you had some pretty great guests on there recently, so it's something definitely worth checking out. But before I let you go, I do have some rapid fire questions that I didn't warn you about, and I usually do. So <laughs> I hope they had. I hope well, you had seen, had a sneak peek of these before I I hit you with them. I have not, so I'm I'm ready. Here's your chance to bust a real estateing or business myth that has bothered you over these years. How what would be a myth you'd like to bust here today? On the real estate side. I don't know. I, I don't, I haven't really, the one thing I do remember about real estate is I remember my father's longtime friend and mentor to me, he said, I wish I could have not sold every piece of real estate I've ever owned. And we tried to do that, but then where we're at today, we're in a great spot and it couldn't have been done without selling real estate. So there's maybe a myth to bust. Yeah, this is, and it might just be a story, but I, I know a fella that has talked about some of the older real estate investors in town and they'll, they'll go on the golf course and, and what they do, it's almost because of the depreciation schedule in the United States, they'll essentially trade properties to renew the depreciation schedules for each other. Yeah. The, you have a trust. There's a, a trust thing that you can also do that I just learned about in the States. Yeah. What book would you recommend everybody checking out? And you cannot say rich dad, poor dad, or think and grow rich. Yeah, uh, yeah, there you go. Thinking Grow Rich was. I do have a book coming out called the Rediscover Your Pow, Picture of Wealth. But I would say that the E Myth is a good one for real estate. Yeah, I don't know. I'm a love him or hate him, a Grant Cardone listener. Again, mm -hmm. some people like him, some people don't. But I do think if you sift through all the kind of pizzazz and show showmanship, which he's just doing for marketing, he does have a couple good uh, pieces on real estate and really watching some of his YouTube videos on how to break down a property fast. To, to figure out if it's even worth looking at. I think that would be someone to look into. What was your biggest business mistake you've made and what did you learn from it? 
probably not taking more risk when I was younger. When you're younger, you you, you have an ability to take risk. As you get older, you start to get those layers of the onion deeper and deeper of there's a lot more to lose. So that might be it. I think even on the spending side, you could probably spend more when you're younger and not be so preservation focused too early. When you do that, you it's to get fired up again. You've got to really get out of your comfort zone and extend yourself when you're older. So the next one does not have to be around real estate investing, but I'm going to give you exactly 60 seconds and you can give everybody one piece of advice that they can implement today to make an impact, whether it's personally or in their business, what would it be? I would probably look to uh, the flow of money. We talked about it a little bit. It's a big, there's a lot of good that can happen by just understanding where your flow goes, subscriptions, different things, looking at your expenses. Using the conveyor belt, we call it the spending accelerator, making sure your money is going in the right place for your goals and values. And again, ha- having the right conversations with your partner. And there is something called the spousal influence awareness from Neil Pasricha, who wrote the happiness equation. And it basically says, when's the right time to talk about your finances? If you're happy 80% of the time and your partner's happy 80% of the time, that means that only 64% of the time you're both happy. So when do you think the best time to talk about finances is when you got to be aware that 32% of the time, one of you is not in the right state of mind. So that is a, a catalyst for many financial disagreements and being aware of when you're both in a good place, whether it's a vacation, whether it's what is that space to say, hey, I've been thinking about buying a rental house and you might have a different outcome for some of those arguments around money or goals that you've been putting forward. Dustin, is there a question or concept you wish we would have covered here today? No, I think that if we could figure out in the world what what actually is the best investment, then there actually wouldn't be one because many people would just, there wouldn't be that edge. So I think we did a good job, Jack. You're a great interviewer and I appreciate all the work that you're doing at REI and, and getting that education out. I appreciate your time. Again, it is servicewealth.com. I'm going to make sure to have that link in the show notes. If you found some value in today's show, can you do us a quick favor and share it with one of your investing friends? Thanks again, Dustin. I hope we can talk again sometime. You bet, Jack. Thanks a lot.